why Danbury indeed? Most everyone knows the story of the British coming to Danbury in 1777 and burning a good portion of the downtown area. Also aware of the Battle of Ridgefield the following day. But what most people don't know is the reason for the British picking Danbury as the uh, site to have this episode occur. Need to go back to 1775 and Boston to start understanding the reason why. In spite of losses during 1775, uh, Continental Army under General George Washington managed to dislodge the British from Boston soon after the British occupied New York. The army had a major need for supplies and food. The occupation of New York by the British caused a significant interruption to the supply route. Beginning in the fall of 1776, the reasons for the attack by the British on Danbury began to take shape. This map shows uh, where some of the supply routes originated out of Boston. And today, the route from Boston to Albany roughly follows that of Mass Route 2. And the lower one follows pretty much what is I-95 today. But you notice that the ones to the south go through New York. The British now control New York. And the question came up, how do we get these supplies to the troops in the middle colonies and the southern colonies? So at the outset of the Revolutionary War, uh, of course, they were colonies were uh, the states were colonies of Britain. And so the British enjoyed a role of occupier in the city of Boston and in most of the other colonies. Continental Army consisted of thousands of local militia and a small handful of professional soldiers and officers. They were not what you would consider to be a disciplined army. Uh, the British made no attempt to break out of the encircling ring of raw recruits, uh, rather looking at them uh, with a great deal of disrespect, uh, that they were nothing more than a, an aging group of men who were creating uh, problems. To the British, the colonists were hastily clothed, sported facial hair, and in many cases, they marched around bare feet. Uh, this is not true, but uh, understand that this is the period before they had uniforms so that most of them were dressed in their farmer's attire. The weapons they carried varied from one person to the next based on where they picked them up from uh, and whether or not they had bayonets. The Tories were even worse at degrading the status of the varied militia uh, when reporting to the British on the status of continental forces. This picture shows uh, again, the elderly and I guess you could say even disabled and frail uh, men that created the, uh, the militias. The primary reason that uh, Washington and the Continental Forces could not make an effort at uh, dislodging British from Boston was that they didn't have any heavy artillery or ammunition. It's a common uh, understanding that in order to control an area of land, you need to take the high ground. Fortunately, the British had not done that and the high ground existed uh, in Dorchester. Washington's forces struggled to keep the British contained in Boston, but by the same token, the British didn't really make much of an effort to go down through the what at that time was Boston Neck and into the rest of the Massachusetts colony. Uh, in a way, they already learned their lesson between uh, Lexington Concord and Bunker Hill, where they had suffered significant losses. While the, uh, Washington's forces were trying to keep them in, contained in Boston, Ethan Allen and Benedict Arnold combined their militia forces and captured Fort Ticonderoga, upstate New York in May of 1775. During the winter of 75-76, under General Henry Knox, uh, the, what's called the Noble Train of Artillery hauled numerous cannon and ammunition through the wildernesses of upstate New York and the Berkshires. Uh, the, path that they took and through the, the winter, the snow and everything, it, it's just an amazing feat that they were able to get these cannon moved from Fort Ticonderoga to Boston. This map gives you a rough idea of the trail that they took in order to get to Boston. Uh, 
Imagine the surprise General Howe and his officers when they awoke on a cold March morning and found that Washington now had a dozen or more cannons sitting on top of Dorchester Heights with the ability to cause significant damage to the British in Boston. It also prevented them from marching down through Boston Neck and to Roxbury and head out of Boston in that direction. By the next morning, March 17th, 1776, General Howe chose to evacuate Boston, moving all of his troops to Nova Scotia. The British, however, did enjoy a significant Tory following around New York. So by July of 1776, General Howe, with the help of Tory spies, makes a move on New York. After several battles, General Howe drives Washington and his army from New York. In the process, hundreds of colonists were taken prisoner and transported to the British prison ships in New York Harbor. Conditions were abysmal. Death rate was in excess of 15%. Uh, and many mornings, the British guard in going down into the hold where the prisoners were kept would start the morning off by telling them that, to remove the dead. They were taken to the surf, to the uh, deck of the ship and unceremoniously dumped into the harbor. This map gives a rough idea of the holdings of areas in and around the, uh, the New York area. The areas in green are controlled by the colonists uh, or are decidedly anti-British. The orange areas, especially around Newport and around New York, are areas that were loyalist strongholds. They had a large number of Tories in place. The purple, or I guess you could call uncontested areas uh, that had about an equal amount of Tories and militia. The British continued to pursue Washington north from New York. Oh, after finally meeting up with his forces just outside of White Plains. After yet another defeat, Washington split his troops with half going west into Pennsylvania and the other half north towards Peekskill. The Continental forces then linked up near West Point and with the approach of winter, they began moving south towards Philadelphia. The outcome of this move was the infamous Valley Forge winter. During the move south, the demand for supplies coupled with the meager deliveries began to take its toll. Continental forces thus had to rely on foraging in order to maintain certain supplies, most notably food. Many colonists gave the army what they could, but the Tories flatly refused to do so. For the Tories, the, the forage was taken by force, and in many cases, the farms were often torched. General Howe went into his winter quarters in New York in October of 1776, seemingly secure in the knowledge that campaigns in the spring and summer of 1777 should bring him final victory. So secure was he in his belief that the rebellion would soon collapse, he sent General Clinton and a force of 6,000 men to secure Newport, Rhode Island, so that it might serve as a base from which supplies from England could be easily distributed and would then allow the British to finally subdue the colonists. December of 1776 found the American cause to be at its lowest point. The long streak of stinging defeats around New York in spite of random victories elsewhere, had seriously Im impaired morale and enthusiasm. Shortages of all necessary equipment, most notably clothing and food, were ever present as was the specter of an army simply evaporating through desertion and the expiration of short-term enlistments. During this period of time, the estimates of the desertion rate were as high as 30% in his fighting forces. Of note is the presence of a military hospital in Danbury. It was noted at the Battle of White Plains uh, in many of the uh, contemporary reports uh, on the Battle of White Plains. Mention is made of taking the wounded and the sick from White Plains to Danbury. Another decimating factor for the colonial forces, though, was the ever-present Camp Fever, today known as Typhus. McCulloch's book, 1776, makes mention of the apparent conditions in the Danbury Military Hospital and the heavy toll it took on the local population. Of note here is the last sentence of the parishioners of a single church in Danbury, Connecticut, more than a hundred would die of camp fever by November. 
1776. With all to gain and nothing to lose, Washington executed a pair of daring thrusts at two British strongholds, namely Trenton and Princeton. In both battles, the ragged and weary colonial forces scored surprising victories. He then took his troops to their winter quarters, Morristown, New Jersey. These victories of Washington were to end up playing a major role in the upcoming spring offenses uh, being planned by General Howe. Despite the recent setback, General Howe remained supremely confident that the spring of 1777 would see the end of the conflict. The initial British strategy in 1777 involved two main prongs of attack aimed at separating New England, where the rebellion enjoyed its most popular support, from the rest of the colonies. Going back to the map of the, uh, the supply lines as they existed before the British took New York, one major principle of battle that has not significantly changed over the centuries is the goal of cutting or destroying the enemy's supply lines. It became quite obvious to General Howe that huge quantities of supplies were being moved out of New, New England and into the Hudson River Valley. These supplies were then sent on to the colonial forces to the north, the west, and the south. Although the British maintained essential control of navigation on Long Island Sound, as well as the Lower Hudson River, they quickly learned from Tory spies that most of Washington's supplies were being funneled over land through points north of New York, namely Peekskill, Fishkill, and Kingston. The first effort of the British to disrupt the supply lines was a raid on Peekskill. On March 23, 1777, 10 ships sailed north and disembarked 500 troops at Peekskill. Only about 50 men were present in the supply depot and were quickly routed. The amount of stores at Peekskill were not sufficient for an army and therefore suggested even larger quantities of stores were probably stockpiled further to the north. There were thoughts of raiding Fishkill as the next step that was thwarted when the newly installed chain across the Hudson River near West Point was installed. Once again, the Tory spy network provided General Howe with the information that he needed. It became apparent that the vast majority of the supplies bound for fish kill were collected and warehoused in Danbury. In order to attempt to sever this major supply line through Danbury, plans were made for the raid of April 1777. From here, the story is, as most of us have learned, the British sailed to Campo Beach in Westport and marched north through Reading and Bethel into Danbury, uh, burned a number of buildings, and then were left in the morning to uh, retreat down through Ridgefield ahead of Benedict Arnold and General David Worcester. So from this point, I guess you could say it's, you know, history plays the rest of it out. Uh, the museum has a large amount of material on the, the, uh, the burning of Danbury and on the Battle of Ridgefield and also has an extensive collection of Revolutionary War material. And anybody who is interested in more information on the Danbury raid or other involvement of the uh, British and colonial forces is more than welcome to call and make an appointment to stop by and they would be glad to help you out. Thank you.